May I ask you to stand up as we honor our passage for today from the book of John, chapter 7, 14 to 19. The Lord continues his ministry pending the cross, which is forthcoming very soon. But when it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. The Jews therefore were marveling, saying, How has this man become learned, having never been educated? Jesus therefore answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If any man is willing to do his will, he shall know of the teaching, whether it is from God or whether I speak for, from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he is true and there is no unrighteousness in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why, why do you seek to kill me? You may be seated. It's a serious topic. True or false? Whenever you pass the church over here by the corner, you ask yourself, is that true or false in terms of its message? Critical question. If it's true, it will save them eternal salvation. If it's false, it will damn them. The other day, I was having coffee. I was sharing the gospel with the man close to me. And I was telling him that what, what you're about to do will damn you. Few pastors do that. Not that I'm brave, but I, I love the person. And if you love the person, you will tell them the painful truth. And this is precisely our passage today. The Lord Jesus Christ was saying things that the multitudes and even the religious leaders did not want. That's our message. It is being rejected. So I was talking to this person and I said, so, so it was a good discussion. It was not adversarial. It was full of respect and even love. And I said, Respectfully, if you do that, it's a clear violation of God's law. And it shows evidence that you're not His. And the response uh, is very telling. He said, you know, I've lived a good life. And if I would just measure what I've done, I think God will accept me. And indeed, this, this man is a good man. And this, this was my response. And my, the intensity of my discussion with this man is such that it's probably the last time. In fact, I told the man, this is the last time I'm going to tell you about this because I've been telling him this for years to avoid what he was about to do. To stop what he was about to do. Uh, I said, uh, if the way to heaven is measured by goodness, you would surpass me many times. Because he, indeed, the man is a kind man, generous man, much, much kinder than me, much, much gentler than me. But it's not. Salvation is not because of our goodness. He thanked me, and I found out a week later they was going to proceed with what, what, what he was going to do. True or False. Of course, this is um, obvious when you're talking about false religions, but the reality or the error of your faith could also be a question even if you belong to a true church, depending on how you operationalize, my favorite term, what you know. And this is basically the gist of what's happening in the Lord's uh, life in this part of the narrative in John. You remember that uh, his brothers was asking him to go to the Feast of the Tabernacles to expose himself to the crowd, to uh, show them his power so that he could be recognized. And he refused. He said, my time has not yet come. And we, maybe, and they, the brothers, probably thought, what time? The time to be famous, the time to be... Uh, recognize, but that's not, that's not the time it's, that it's talking about. I'll tell you what that time is in a while. But later on he went. He did go to the Feast of the Tabernacle. But not at the time, not at the hour that they wanted him to go. He was looking for a timing. And that timing is so that he can maximize the impact of what he wanted to happen, which is basically maximum persecution. Maximum persecution. The will of the Father to him is to be crucified. 
And he, his life is very intentional. Jesus Christ made a lot of assertions. And it is important that we realize this. And it's important, and I'll overuse the word operationalize today once again, that we operationalize his claim that we claim in our lives. Alam mo yung mga assertion ng Panginoon? He, he claims to be God. He claims to be God. Is that apparent in our lives? He claims to be from heaven. He claimed to be the savior of the world. The determiner of eternal destinies. That's why when I was talking to this man, I said, if he's the determiner of eternal destinies, the evidence that you are his is not good works, but obedience and complete submission to him. It's the evidence. If you don't submit to him and do what you want, with the justification that I've done many good works anyway that off-balances the bad thing that I'm about to do, He is not the Lord of eternal life. You are. And your eternal life is dependent on your ability to outbalance the good with the, the bad with the good. The Lord claimed that He was of equal footing or equal basis and must be equally honored with the Father. The Lord Jesus claimed that he has the power to raise the dead, to raise us from the dead. And he also claimed that he will rise from the dead himself. He claimed to be the one to whom the whole of the Old Testament scriptures pointed to. He claims to be the supreme judge. He claimed to be without sin. He claimed to have the authority to forgive sin the authority to answer our prayers, claim to be the bread of life, the substance, any other substitute, we've studied about it, is nothing but filler, false filler. He claims to be the only source of spiritual sustenance, he claims to be the Messiah, Son of God. Now, we've, you've heard all that, and you'll probably hear that again throughout this Holy Week. But is it operationalized in our lives? So that that reality of who we claim as our master, if our lives intersect and contradict that, we get disturbed. Of course, all these claims and all these demands polarize those who heard. So either you ignore it or it polarizes you. All these claims that Jesus made is so massive in its truth and its implication that people either turn it off, accept it, and set it aside, or reject it. There were some who accepted it, but the majority rejected it. Remember that. Our truth is commonly rejected. This is related to what we call the doctrine of the remnant. Not, not too many people will subscribe to what is preached from Scripture. So if, if you have a religion that is attractive, that is widely accepted, check it out. The Lord got rejection from his hometown and he got rejection from his what I call his home church in Capernaum. Pati home church niya, his uh, synagogue in Capernaum rejected him. This is what he said to them. I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. The Lord lamented, Jerusalem, Jerusalem who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling but he was not deterred by the unbelief he encountered he continued to confront unbelievers and because of that his time was coming and again that time that is coming that he is precisely timing is persecution hostility because he knows the message he carries will antagonize and will lead to his murder remember this is the message that we bear. And this is the message that we operationalize in our lives. But what I want us to do today is not just realize the theological content of the passage, but to put it in our lives. Ito bang mensahe natin, nangyayari sa buhay natin? Because that's my great fear with GFC. Ang dami nating alam, pero yung buhay natin, kabalik karan. And I'm really beginning to feel that that is the great danger of theological churches. Parang iniisip natin, since we have the truth, we're immune to sin. In fact, the Pharisees were exactly in that position. They were the great religious uh, 
intellects. But they were so far from what the Lord intended to, to do with his people. In the first 13 verses of chapter 7, the Lord refused to go openly to the feast. Ayon pumunta. But then, today's passage, he goes. Halfway point ng feast, when the feast was already filled with attenders, dun siya pumunta. You know why? He was preventing an ambush. Jesus at this point was still a little bit popular because of the healings and the miracles he had, uh, he had done. If he went when uh, he was expected at the beginning, he would have been ambushed, arrested, and probably prematurely murdered nung mga religious teachers who was really angry at him at this point already. But he went at the halfway point where the crowd was there, and this prevented the religious leaders from arresting him because there, was already, there were a lot of witnesses already. So this is the context that we arrive in. We have three points this morning. First is the knowledge of God. Ang katulungan ng Diyos. This is what we see in this passage. When it was now the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began to teach. So this is what the rabbis are doing in that temple. During the feast, they were just teaching. They were taking a corner and they would start to teach. It is now his time. He is now exposing himself. Ano mo yung time na yon? It's the Father's purpose that he would reveal the truth that the religion that Israel chose to propagate is not true. It is full of error. It damns. On this occasion, the escalating hostility became vocal as the crowd accused him of many things as he articulated the reality of their religion, beginning, of course, with the religious leaders. He began to teach, and the public began to turn against him as well. He fearlessly proclaimed the uncensored truth about his identity and his mission. And now people was put in a position to make a choice. True or false. That's my favorite kind of test. True or false. Hindi pa nga multiple choice eh. Yung mga test. True or false. But true or false questions is intensified pag ginawa siyang right minus wrong. So this question, is this person true or false, had eternal implications for those listening. A decision, is, a decision has to be made. And again, I want to bring it down to us today. As you study these passages, and this is very theologically heavy, I hope you don't doze off you know, on the first verse. So I'm going to start speaking loud so you don't sleep. Pero medyo theologically heavy to. That's why I want you to personalize it even though I can't force practicalizing it kasi hindi siya utilitarian message eh. Hindi siya prosperity message. It's a theological message. But I want you to connect it to your life. Is this really being operationalized in your life? For them, they had to decide is he true or is he false? For us, the question is are we true or are we false? Is this truth just truth at a distance? Or is this truth, truth in our lives? The knowledge of God. Yung kagunungan ng Panginoon. The Jews therefore were marveling saying, How has this man become learned? Having never been educated. Sa Spanish, you know I'm 90% Spanish, did you know that? Sa Spanish, mal educado. I saw your face when I said I'm 90% Spanish. It's true. 90% from the neck down. I told you I was going to keep you awake. As they listened to Jesus' unequaled teaching, many had been, who had been there were astonished with this mastery of Scripture. I'm bringing it down to my level. I guess we can compare it in, in today's world. When you listen to a sermon that is man-made, it's interesting, it's um, entertaining, but only for a moment. But when you listen, maybe some of you, when you first listen to maybe MacArthur's or Arsis Pro's first expository message, verse by verse, hinihima, you said, wow, there's a certain depth. It hit me deep inside. So they noticed the difference. 
And this is what they said. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. Now even his enemies noticed the difference. The officers therefore came to the chief priest and Pharisees and they said to them, Why did you not bring him? Bakit hindi niyo inaresto? The officer answered, Never did a man speak the way this man speaks. The Pharisees therefore answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? Yung pananalita ni Jesus. The knowledge of God is so different from those claiming to be preaching the knowledge of God but actually preaching the knowledge of man. And some of you are here. Not all, but some are here. Because you notice that difference. Not because we, we, we are uh, full of the knowledge of God, but in our attempt, as we uh, preachers as we are, in attempting to preach biblically, you've sensed the difference. And these people sensed it as well. You see, when God preaches, when Jesus utters a word from God, it penetrates the soul. It does not necessarily make you feel good. Sometimes it might even make you feel bad. But you know it's for you. Because it is the maker talking to the one that was made. So yan, napansin nila. This is what's happening here. That's the context of that passage. Well, some of them were amazed. Some of them noticed the difference. Some of them maybe accepted it, embraced it, but very few did. Most of them were indignant, especially the Jewish authorities. In fact, they felt threatened. Even as they watched the miracles, even watching the dead ro- ro- rising, even watching the power of Jesus, they, they were not perturbed. They, they did not walk away from error. It cost too much to recognize the truth that this being manifested in front of them. They chose false, falsehood and error. They were antagonized, just like the kind man I was talking to. Sabi niya, alam mo, actually, nirerespeto kita, the, the man from Starbucks I was telling you about. With all the pastors that he would ask, I'm the one he said he wanted to ask because he knew I was going to tell him what he needed to hear without fear. He respected me, but he didn't want to hear what I had to say. But he knew it was true. And after having said all that, he chose what was false. The pull of sin is sometimes stronger than the blatant truth being spoken of by God. Are you like that? Having known truth, having studied truth, still decide to do error, just balancing the balance of goodness and badness. So ang ginawa nila, they accused him and assessed him with ad, an ad hominem argument, which is basically an appeal to prejudice versus intellect. Instead of assessing the reality and the profundity and the depth of what he was saying, sabi nila, hindi naman nag-aral yan eh. Doesn't matter if what he's saying penetrates us, or if it's true. But he didn't go to the seminary, basically is what it's saying. Mal-edukado yan. So instead of assessing what he was saying, they questioned his credentials, challenging his authority to teach, because he lacked an author- authorized education and legitimate right to teach. And that his word should be disregarded as merely the opinion of self, self-styled intruder who had no true connection in the established and authoritative fraternity of teachers of the time. Even today, a pastor who would speak directly, authoritatively from scripture would probably not gain popularity. Not, not all the time. Sometimes they would be popular. But most of the time, they would be rejected. They would be rejected. And that's what's happening to Jesus Christ. They sensed the reality of what he was saying, but he was being rejected. Verse 16, Jesus therefore answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. So the Lord's reply was direct and devastating. He said that his knowledge was not derived from any human institution and his teachings opposed that of the teachers in Judaism. See, what the Pharisees and the people were expecting is the teaching of Jesus uh, that needed to reflect the traditional teaching of the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders. Gusto nila, mayroon silang certain method. Today, sasabihin mo siguro, a pragmatic teaching, practical teaching, 
uh, illustrative teaching, seeker-friendly teaching. Pag hindi ganun yung teaching mo, you're ineffective. You are not properly taught. You are not uh, properly well-versed. You are culturally off. Pero ito, mas mabigat. Ito, sinasabi dito, mal-edukado ka. You, you didn't go to seminary. You have no right to teach. Why? Even though, remember, they said, ibang mag, mag-preach tong si Jesus. And in a sense, that was a positive comment. Naiiba siya sa iba. It was not negative. Sapol, kumbaga. This guy, when he preaches, reaches down to the heart. And then, the next, the next word would be, pero hindi naman nag-aaral yan eh. You know, and that's the heart of man. You hear the truth, and sin reminds you, oh, laban sa akin yan. Pag nakinig ka dyan, pipigilan ako yan. Then, immediately, you justify why you should not listen. Mal-edukado yan. Oh, tama naman yan si Pastor AJ. Pero ganito yan eh. This is exactly what's happening here. So you go forum shop for a pastor. Or, if you don't like him, look for something in his character. Not in what he's saying. Remember, the Bible says the, 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 the Lord would choose the weak things of this world to deliver. The, the, the reality of Scripture, its rebuke and its exhortation, is not contingent on the ability, the capacity of the preacher. Because it is clear that the preacher is chosen because of his weakness. But in this case, Jesus Christ himself carries the authority and the word, and he is the word. But still, they rejected him. Why? Again, bottom line, rejection of truth. Because, because it has an implication, an operation. So, ad hominem, hindi nag therefore, wag pakinggan. Again, do you do that? Do you justify a favorite sin? This is what they were doing to Jesus Christ. He said, My teaching is not mine, but from the Father. Ibig niya sabihin, I'm faithful to what the Father said. Of course, the Pharisees, the religious teachers, were not faithful anymore to the original Old Testament. They made it ritualistic, legalistic, salvation by works. They were preaching the same verse. They would even probably ask people to stand up, read the text, but when they preach about it, iba na yung application. Iniba na nila. Why? Because ritualism led to money. Legalism meant money. Remember, yung mga sacrifice, pag nagkasala ka, kailangan mag-alay ka. Yung iaalay mo, babayaran mo sa akin. That's what's happening here. And that's what's happening today. So it's very important that you recognize truth from error, true and false, and you better also be sure that your heart is prepared to accept the truth and reject the error, regardless of its consequence on your lifestyle. Satan's favorite ploy from the beginning. In fact, the most dangerous crowd are those who are so immersed in truth that they have already been, they become experts on rationalization. This is what's happening here. Sabi, sabi ni Jesus, in a, I'm just echoing, I'm just preaching what God said. And that's, today, that's what we should do also. When we read scripture, we better just be saying and interpreting scripture just like, just, just the way God said it. When a preacher preaches, it better be just an echo of what the Bible says. Not an addition, not an improvement, not an adaptation to what the culture would, would accept. It's like shouting something into a cave. When you, say, when, you, when you shout into a cave to get an echo, you say, hello, 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 hello. Hi, 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 hi. This better not happen. You say, hello, and he says, yeah, how are you, how are you, how are you? He said, I'm just, I am just teaching what the Father, the one who sent me, teaches. And then he said, he who is of God, hears the words of God, for this reason you do not hear them, because you are not of God. And now, marami ng ano dito eh. Um, Diagnostics. Sinasabi na niya, there's a rebuke already. I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. Because those who know God will recognize true and false. There's a built-in mechanism already in true believers with the Holy Spirit, especially now, to detect error. So ang sabi niya, He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not, because you are not of God. Do you hear the words of God? Or do you hear it and then misinterpret it 
It's not the weakness of the preacher. Sometimes it is, but don't blame the preacher all the time. Means and tama yung exposition, but your understanding is off because your frequency is off. Maybe you're not even a Christian. So he's saying that only Christ has perfect knowledge of the Father. So he's just repeating that, unlike what the Jews are doing. So ito yung sinasabi na, we've been saying, di ba? Jesus was saying, uh, that my time has not yet come. My time has not yet come. Di ba? This is the point. His time has come. Kasi ano na to eh? Full bore retaliation na to. All bets are off. He's already saying, you guys are full of error. This is true. You are false. The time has come. When, when, when you call off time, not Kairos. You know, this is Kronos. The Lord is working on hours now. Diba? Uh, just a few hours ago, he was, um, or a few days ago, he was being told to go to the feast. Ngayon, pumunta siya gitna ng feast. So he's just working on hours and days now. Ganun na precise. So when he said, the time is now, the time is now. So nung hindi, no holds barred, he was already inviting the prophesied persecution. Wala na siyang pinipigilan. That's the time. Hindi yung time na para kay kilalanin. Baliktad na naman eh. Our expectation as preachers is that my time will come. My ship will, will sail in. Ibig sabihin, makikilala ka na ng pastor. The example of the Lord is, when this preacher's time came in, he started really revving up the truth to the point where they're gonna crucify him in a few days. Are we ready to do that? Are we ready to do that? The man I was speaking with sent me yung sa Starbucks, I was telling you earlier. Praise God, sent me a message and said, I respect what you said, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I, th- I feel I've done my job. I said the truth, the decision is this. Matthew 7, 28, the result was that when Jesus had finished these words, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So remember, you know, yung, uh, the irony of, of, of how, what they felt about Jesus. Their anger is welling up, but their amazement and their recognition of his wisdom is revving up. Nakita nyo? They, they recognize what he's saying has depth and profundity, and yet their anger is revving up. How, how can that be true? Because it intersects with their sin. And that can happen today. But today, what we do, as they did before, they just crucified Jesus. Ngayon, we just shut the preacher down, or you just discontinue the reading, or you just, you just find somebody who would preach otherwise. Because the type of preaching that he was saying penetrates and has implications. So that's the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God penetrates but is often rejected. Number two, point number two of our three points this morning, the knowledge of God's people. The knowledge of God's people. We extract from verse 17 now, if any man, tayo naman to, if any man is willing to do his will. I hope you got the first point. Ha? Yung karunungan ng, ng, ng Diyos. It's profound. It reads you. Sabi nga nila, the Bible is the only book wherein the book reads the reader. Binabasa ako nito ah. But it's often rejected. Now, second point is, tayo naman, the knowledge of God's people. True. God's true people. If any man is willing to do his will, he shall know. Still talking about knowledge. Of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. And you've heard this uh, $100 word, perspicacity of the mind of a true believer. Yung perspicacity ng mind mo pag naging believer ka. What's perspicacity? Acute mental vision or discernment. Does not matter if you're a uh, grade one student or... You have your doctorate degree. Your mind becomes sharp. You recognize truth from the false. Throughout Jesus' ministry, the false disciples would ask not for clarity of who he was, 
but for the receipt of what he can do. That's one measurement of the true from the false disciple. Matthew 16:1, the Pharisees, Sadducees came up, testing him as, and asked him to show a sign. Patunayan mo, alam mo, ang tunay na mana ng palataya, mangungusap sa yo, yung katotohanan, start speaking to you, and the more you accept of the truth and the rebuke and the correction, the more of that perspicacity of mind will be given to you. Clarity will be given to you. Why is that important? As soon, as soon as you step out that door, you make decisions about your job, about your marriage, about your children. It's not all gonna be. Um, it's not all gonna be comfortable and nice, but it could all be guided by God because you have clarity. But the Pharisees and today's religious world look for. What could be sensed? Yung nahahawakan. Not God's people. Those who are willing to do His will. Willing to do His will. Regardless of what that God's will is. Are you following me? Not what you want God's will to be for your life. Pag sinabi ng Panginoon, sumunod ka. Kahit masakit, susunod ka. Perspicacity of mind is promised to you. If any man is willing to do his will, he shall know. Clarity. The Jews answered and said to him, What sign? Puto sign. Puto sign. Nung hindi niya nabinigay yung sign, pinako na siya. Don't go back 2,000 years. This is not historical. This is current. This is the same heart of mind today for us. Ganun, ganyan din tayo ngayon eh. We have that propensity as well. And I think I'm also talking to Christians. Sometimes you do that as well. Faith comes not by receiving or hinging. It comes by hearing. Romans 10, 17. The Lord consistently denied the request of people for what could be sensed. Because unbelievers, no matter how many miracles or benefits or blessings is received by them, such people will refuse to believe. And such provision as a response uh, to request for proof will even harden the hearts of those people. But Jesus promised, listen to this, the person who is honestly seeking the truth, willing to do God's will, whatever that is, the promise is that he will know the truth about Christ's teaching and will be clear on God's will for his life. Now that's very practical for today. That's very practical for today. And I'm not making it up. Gusto mo ba maging clear ang direksyon ng Panginoon sa buhay mo? No promises of roses but even the thorns and the trials will be precisely, and another favorite term of mine, calibrated for your good and his glory. The Holy Spirit who confirms the truth about Christ will have its anointing the obedient sacrificial willing heart. 1 John 2.20 You have an anointing from the Holy One and you all know. We've been talking about a very harsh term judicial hardening. Diba? Pinag-uusapan natin yung kung ayaw maniwala because you won't believe you can't believe. Dahil ay mo maniwala, hindi mo na kayang maniwala. That's judicial hardening. But remember, when we were talking about that over and over, as we studied the first few chapters of John, we were also talking about, as a preamble, the judicial softening that accompanied that principle. Not only did, it, did Scripture talk about people who won't believe and therefore can't believe, it also talks about, minsan nga, una pa, people who would believe and therefore could believe. Yung mga taong dahil sila ay susunod at maniniwala, therefore, nabigyan ng paniniwala. Just like that man who said, Lord, I believe, help my... Do you have weak faith? I do. At minsan sinasabi ko, Lord, tulungan mo naman akong sumunod. 
In that again, as I was mentioning the last time, holy desperation that is so critical to Christian growth. You will be given the anointing, the understanding, because your heart is willing. We said that the same sun that softens the wax hardens the clay. But remember, we said it softens also. If you're will are you willing? Are you willing? Are you tired yet of following your ways? Or we simply get rid of the truth teller to get your way. That's what the crowd was doing here. But the true believer will have the knowledge of God given in full anoint, anointing. True Christians have a built-in lie detector. Listen to this. This is what John MacArthur said about this passage. True Christians have a built-in lie detector. Isn't that fantastic? And persevere in the truth. Those who remain in heresy and apostasy manifest the fact that they were never genuinely, genuinely born again. So those people who go to false churches feel sorry for them. But at the same time, they're not completely innocent. The reason they, they remain in that church is because they like it. Exposure to truth will not make them turn. It, they will reject it and remain in error because they are not of God. As for you, the anointing which you receive from him abides in you and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as, as his anointing teaches you about all things and is true and is not a lie and just as it has taught you, you abide in him. Sabe, a Christian is given knowledge, given the anointing, hindi na kailangan ng teacher, not, not that you don't need pastors or Bible teachers or D group leaders anymore. It's just that, madedetect mo ang false teacher at ang false pastor. Madedetect mo. Parang mali. And how do you detect that? We are given the word of God. The perspicacity, ability to understand the meaning of scripture. And this is very critical. This is very critical. Jesus' challenge was bold. But it was not without precedent. Similar promises are given throughout the Old Testament to God's faithful people. In the book of Deuteronomy, God promised Israel if they would be faithful to Ingsabe. But from there, you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart and all your soul. Do you do that? Do you have holy discontents to the Lord, manifest yourself to me. Ang nakuha ko dito, willingness to obey. If you're willing to obey, then this will be given to you. The personification of wisdom in Proverbs 1, this is familiar to you, illustrates the clear-cut challenge Jesus made in this verse. Those who heed wisdom's call, yung wisdom that Proverbs is talking about, those who are willing to do God's will will receive further knowledge. You want guidance for your business, for your marriage, for, for your problematic whatever? Wisdom shouts in the streets, says Proverbs. She lifts her voice in the square. Verse 23, turn to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you and I will make my words known to you. Proverbs 128 also revealed the faith of those who harden their hearts and are unwilling to turn to God. Then they will call on me, but I will not answer. There you go again, judicial hardening. Blessing and, and, and warning. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. After a while, exposures to truth hardens if the willingness to obey is not there. Because they hated knowledge and they did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof. Last point. The source then of true knowledge. Verse 18. He who speaks for himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he's true and there is no unrighteousness in him. So this is now Jesus saying, I'm the source of true knowledge, Jesus Christ. And we present the book of John and the different passages of scripture, the different books of scripture to you with our weak abilities to present it to you with clarity and with faithfulness and accuracy because this is where the word of God and the truth of God will be delivered to God's people. He who speaks for himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one 
who sent him, he is true and there is no unrighteousness. Two characteristics of every false teacher. First, he speaks of himself. His own authority, not of God's. We've been criticized for expositional preaching as if it's a hobby horse or a style to be worshipped. No, it's a fear. <laughs> it's a fear. If you don't hang on to God's truth, if you don't preach while the verse is back there as if watching us saying, preach me, not you, then the propensity to veer off is there even for us. Because we tend to preach ourselves, don't we? What is true and false? The Lord is saying that the false teachers, the false prophets that they're accusing him of, speaks his words, not of God's. The Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them nor commanded them, not spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and the deception of their own minds. And I think that false teachers abounds more now than before. Abounds even more now than any time in history because of media. Second, what the passage is talking about, what is the source of false knowledge as against true knowledge? A false teacher seeks his own glory, not God's. I guess the Lord's going in the defensive here now. Sinasabi niya lang. This is what a false teacher is, and which I am not. False prophets invariably proclaim their own musings, their own glibness, their own relevance to the culture, to attract followers, and motive to secure personal gain. Their goal is not to feed the flock who bites back sometimes, but to fleece it. So they give them what they want to hear. So that they give him fleece. Fleece. Quarta. Pini fleece. Paul characterized false teachers as Men of depraved mind, deprived of the truth, who surpassed that godliness is a means of gain. So when you listen to a preacher, that includes us. You better have a diagnostic mind. You better use that perspicacious mind. Yung perspicacity na binigay sa you better use it. Because I think numerically, there are much, for every one faithful teacher, hula ko lang to, this is completely unscientific gut feel. For every one faithful teacher, there's a hundred false teachers. That, that's my gut feel. They are teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. So even then, this is the Lord's topic. Who must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. Jesus Christ, the true teacher, the one, the Messiah is about to be crucified, never sought his own glory, did not come to be served, but to serve. Gave his life as a ransom for many. He was gentle and humble. Did not regard equality with God to be grasped, but emptied himself in the form of a bond servant. Made in the likeness of man, obedient to the point of death on the cross. That is an example, not only to preachers, but to the entire congregation. That is true Christianity. He did mind performing menial tasks for his people, washing their feet. But they were going to reject him. They're going to kill him. So he basically go from deferment, his time, withholding his time, to defensive, to now offensive. Ito babanatan na niya sa last verse natin. Bibira na siya dito. Did not Moses give you the law? Nagka-graduate. You know, God will give you the truth. But there's softening, there's hardening, and there's, there's damnation. You know, sometimes, ano, that's why the, the faithful puppets sometimes sound hard. But if we don't tell you that there's a graduated, allowable response to truth, you sit on truth until you become hardened and you don't even know it. And anyway, that's how the passage is going. If you're not ready to obey truth and even ready to uh, discount it, don't come back, Muna. Come back when you're ready because it'll harden you. 
Did not Moses give you the law and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill him? That's complete. Pag inisa isa mo yan, that's complete condemnation. The, he was saying that yung pamamaraan nyo ng salvation that you're presenting to people, it dumbs. Because you're presenting salvation by works, by obedient, uh, obeying the law, which they basically, uh, the Ten Commandments was expanded into 600 plus laws, and you obey this, and we're the administrators of those laws, and we're making money for the administration of those laws, especially the sacrifices. And basically, sinasabi ni Jesus, you are the false because you're making money of uh, true scripture by mutating it. He gave you the law, but you know what? The law never saved anyone. Because the law was not intended to be obeyed so people would be saved. Did you hear what I said? Let me clarify to you. The Ten Commandments was given to you to damn you, not to be obeyed by you. Bigat, no? Because the Ten Commandments, if used as a means, and this is what God is saying, if you chose the route of the Ten Commandments to go to heaven, you have to obey the Ten Commandments in the entirety of your life with no single mistake. Not one mistake. So, sinasabi, ito yung pinapresent nyo. You call me false? This is what you're presenting as true. Did not Moses give you the law, which is basically saying, as a means to salvation, and yet none of you obeys the law. So, ibig sabihin, you're the propagators of error. Why do you seek to kill me? That's, and what he's saying here is, I'll just simplify it to you because I'm out of time again. <laughs> Why do you seek to kill me? You just, you're violating that, the sixth commandment, thou shalt not. Yan lang po ibig sabihin ng verse na yun. Hindi nyo nga nagawa eh. Binibenta nyo pa. Tapos ito pa, intention nyo pang i-violate nga itong isa pa to. And basically, that's the entire message of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was led to his crucifixion. And this is our message, is salvation by grace. And when you pass our kababayan, right on top of that escalator, you better be praying that somehow they walk through our doors. Not because we're the worthy vessels of truth, but because we hold the truth for some reason. But look, look inside. That's, the, the, the Catholic faith is, is as close to Judaism as I can think of with this ritualism and its connection to the Old, Test, Old and even New Testament. Ang lapit eh. Salvation by words and ritualism. Jesus Christ and Him crucified is given to desperate people who knew that they could not even keep one day in perfection, in obedience, in compliance to the requirement of the law if it is going to be used for salvation. Kaya araw-araw na nakakasala tayo, and we say to God, Lord, I'm sorry, kinamuhi ko na naman yung kapatid ko. Sa Panginoon pa nga, minsan eh. We hate our own brothers and sisters. And if that disturbs you, it's just, just an evidence that you recognize and operationalize the truth that you are saved by grace because He will forgive you. And He he forgave you, He will keep forgiving you, and He will complete you. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. This is the truth that Satan has been trying to destroy, mutate, modify, at ang pinakamalapit dyan sa katotohanan is the most dangerous. It's not paganism, it's not Satanism, it's not even ritualism. It is evangelical religion that's propagating utilitarianism, preaching the same scripture, meaning even expository preaching, but not preaching surrender, lordship of life as evidence of that surrender. Now that no one, now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident for the righteous man shall live by faith. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we may be justified by faith. The law was created para ituro ka sa salvavida. Nalulunod ka eh. Yung batas is designed to make you drown. Hindi ko kaya to eh. Hindi ko kaya sumunod sa Panginoon. And Christ is saying, you, you, you can't, you can't. 
you have to cry out to me, admit your inability, I'll save you. And the ability to obey is not the means to, but the evidence of salvation that will be given to you in the form of grace, not achievement. Did you follow me? Is that what happened to you? If that's what happened to you, you obey God, not to go to heaven, but because you're going to heaven, you obey God. You obey God. Perspicacity of scripture, unction of the Holy Spirit, empowerment of the Holy Spirit will all come into play after that. I know this is highly theological. I know it is. If you're not a Christian, you probably don't understand, but this is a Christian church. A lot of churches will avoid preaching this because you, if you're not a Christian, you probably won't come back next week. But if you're a Christian, you understand what I'm talking about. Because yung isang point na lang naiintindihan mo, the inability to obey God. And the taste of forgiveness on a daily basis. It's a daily Christian fare. And that's what the cross is talking about. And the religious leaders and the multitudes will have none of it. So sabi, maledukado. Hindi nag-aaral sa rabbinical schools. Malalim ang sinasabi, pero walang diploma. In fact, yun yung ad- adhaminum argument na yan, ginamit yan in the past eh. Taga Nazareth yan eh. What kind of argument is that? Okay naman yung sinasabi, kaya lang, taga Nazareth eh. People do that. You would do that. If something from the word hits you, but you don't like it, mag adhaminum ka. Be careful. Hardening follows. Last verses. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. This is willful unbelief, willful rejection. For Christ is the end of the law. For the Judaizers, for the multitudes, end of the business, end of ritualism, end of dichotomous religion, which means I can have my sin and my religion as well. End of that. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Are we real? Are you for real? I'm not talking down to you. That's a question that we must ask ourselves. Lord, nagpapakatotoo na ba ako? Am I, am I a Christian whose heart is malleable? Alam mo yung malleable? Ang ganda ng definition sa, Bible, sa dictionary nun eh. Beaten into shape with the hammer. I like that. We're beaten into shape unto Christianity with the hammer. Everything that happens to us as a Christian is calibrated by God to drive us towards Christ. But the, Lord, the world rejected and as we proceed on down to John, we will see how the Lord made a way for even his rejectors to have a way back to him. Let us pray. Lord, I pray for understanding. Not just for understanding, but for application in our lives. I don't know. Sometimes as the elders prepare these messages that are, sometimes we, we wonder, how, how can this make people change? Pa- paano matutulungan itong mga sermon namin? Yung nanay doon sa aming kongregasyon na ginugulpin ng asawa. To the husband who, who, who can't sustain his family financially. We, that, that's ourself wanting to be practical. Sincere naman kami as pastors, Lord. We want to be of help to our people. But we know, Lord, that to really help our people, we have to teach them your word. We, we want to teach them practical helps. We do. Even as businessmen, as professionals. But we, we stay the course. We, we teach your word. Because we know, Lord, that if we guide people to you principally, the understanding of your word, that they would cry out to you, we will not be the one to guide them. We will connect them to you. And when they're connected to you, the sovereign, the controller of everything, then that's the best hope they can get before your purposes for them will be fulfilled. Why don't you take a minute to pray? The following ministries are designed for you not only to learn but also to invest your time. Uh, we're hoping to develop friendships inside these uh, ministries, uh, evolve into uh, fellowship groups. PDF 242, study of the book of Ephesians on April 5, Thursday at Canvas Events. Women of Grace, study of the book of Galatians, April 13. Men of the Word, Bible study scheduled on April 14. 
Saturday, 7.30 at McDonald's Commerce Avenue. Let us pray. Lord, once again, we thank you so much for holding us. We thank you for being patient with us. Lord, help us to desire to be knowledgeable of you so that we may be a blessing to your name. Help us to have the desire to reach out to others, to evangelize those who are around us. I pray, Lord, that you would protect our church, not only from the evil one, but also even from us. Help us, Lord, to love one another. We are all unlovable. That's why you're great, because you love the unlovable. So help us, Lord, to love one another and then love the outsiders from this church. And may you be able to use us, the church, the only organization that you put up, the only instrument of grace that you have on earth to propagate the message that you died for. Help us to reflect on all that this coming week. May the Lord, our, may the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. May the eyes of your hearts be enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe according to the working of his great might which he accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Amen. Have a good week, everyone.